Joe, this is episode three of my climb back from the abyss. As you can see from the rating graph, it's been a hard couple years. Really like, I guess, the kids catching up to me in just old age. And now is my attempt to come back. And this show is, a lot of it is about me holding myself accountable to a, a wider unknown audience out there. And it has become pretty interesting just because I have to, during the week, subconsciously, I'm thinking about what I'm doing with my own chess improvement. And I think it, it's at least helping me hold the line, if you will, of my training. Um, so an amazing chess miracle happened that I have to report from last week. Uh, on the show, Vishnu uh, was talking to me and saying, um, why aren't you, I was showing my list of tournaments. And he was like, well, why aren't you playing Baltimore Open? And I said, well, you know, the old lady's not going to let me. i got to help take care of the kids on the weekend and stuff. But then this chess miracle happened where the grandparents came into town and they were like, yeah, you want to go play a tournament? Go play a tournament. So I got to go play this tournament just on the spur of the moment, Baltimore Open. Pretty well organized, you know, not, not a huge event or anything, but very well organized. Uh, played... Uh, I believe the first guy was an FM, then four IMs, um, two of them very strong IMs, and scored four out of one. So, you know, not the greatest result, but definitely a small boost of confidence and like just a little bit of encouragement I needed to feel like I was making some kind of progress. So this is my cartoonish graph um, about... The fee date hasn't updated yet, but that's my guess, around somewhere around there, around 24.50. So um, hopefully this show won't last too long in, ter in terms of years or whatever, and I'll get to 2,500. Um, and I just want to express maybe the goal. It's like a lot of people have a goal of master and whatever, and, and this is kind of weird because I already was a GM. you got to reach 2,500 and yada, yada. But like long term, if I feel like if I want to play in cool events like the U.S. Senior and the um, Senior Team, all that kind of stuff, I'm definitely going to have to be above 2,500. Uh, I never got to play in any Olympiads, not even close. I played the Mind Games 2008 in China. That was really cool. But I was never the guy to get to travel and do fun and cool stuff. So long term, that's kind of the aim here uh, with me forcing myself back up in addition to just wanting to feel good about myself. I feel like too, if, if you teach some chess, it doesn't feel good if you're not working on it yourself. At least I'll speak for my, my, my own self there is it feels a little bit hypocritical and also like you're not engaged with the material, let's call it. Okay. Let me give a brief update on just some basic things. Uh, in terms of improvement, uh, one thing I added here this at the very bottom, is that I've gone off blitz. And I want to talk a little bit about that because uh, it's kind of interesting to me. You know, I, I feel like over the years I play blitz the way I think some other people play video games, like Resident Evil or whatever it is, you know. Uh, in that it's, it, you know, it's a diversion. It helps me relax. Um, but I think it really hurts me in terms of my conscientiousness of, a good move, right? Like, especially you play a real event with a longer time control. Uh, the problem is that if you're not really going deep on your decisions, then, you know, you're going to play superficial moves. And an insight into this whole thing uh, that I got recently was this discovery about modafinil. And they did this, which is marketed as provigil. It's a drug. And I finally got into it and got to understand what's going on. And it's this thing where whatever you're doing, it's going to make you feel better about yourself while you're doing it. So they they did it with chess players. They did a big experiment. And the results were that you performed 15% better on Modafinil. And, uh, the, there, and even with that 15%, there was a downside. And that downside was that people were losing on time. It was really interesting because like they were so into what they were thinking that they lost on time. But even with that downside, they were still 15% gain. Red on blue, hard to look at. All right, I'll fix it. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm still a beginner with this whole, this whole thing. So uh, 
I'll fix the red on blue. Um, so anyways, about this modafinil, uh, the thing that I got out of it is that I oftentimes, you know, when you're in a difficult position and you've already thought about it for a while, a lot of times you're just like, screw it, and you just make a move. And that's what I'm trying to avoid, and I know playing Blitz uh, does that to me. It makes me. It makes it easier for me to just be like, oh, okay, let's just play the intuitive move. And that's not. That's just not what good chess is, in my experience. Uh, did some uh, problems, and now that I played this tournament, now I have 10 games left to review. I'm down on the clock. Uh, in terms of uh, my my game review, which is the most important thing I do. And we look at my tournaments. I got one coming up weekend after next. So I'm not going to be able to get all 10 done. But, you know, that's on the agenda. And uh, my fitness, I always do an update. No, not doing too good. I feel I got some weird, like, hip problem. And it's just been a real bummer. So my fitness, absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, today, what I thought I would do is show a game uh, that where I felt like me uh, talking about uh, a particular position, teaching it, if you will, helped me uh, understand it much better myself. So sometimes last year, Vishnu was... Um, talking to me about doing something with the Carlsbad because I had recommended it to him. Um, <laughs> so actually, I posted on Twitter, Kai Greg said he took it, took Modafinil for a while. And uh, I have, I, I, by the way, I talked to a, a neurologist friend of mine. He's like, yeah, you know, the problem is there might be a negative feedback loop. So like it might end up hurting your overall happiness or some weird thing like that. So I don't know if I'm, I would try it once for sure. I don't, you know, I, I and I don't understand too. Like, is it, it feels kind of illegal to do it too. I don't, no one's getting drug tested or anything, but you know, so <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there's a whole swirl of questions around this modafinil and performance enhancing drugs. And I'm sure that the top players are doing it. You know, I'm positive. Um, I think Scott posted the rating was 15% higher. Yeah, that's my understanding. And right, I have another friend I talked to him. Uh, Kai Grex is talking about um, hypersonia. Actually, I don't know what hypersonia may be. What he was saying was that he was having insomnia, like real trouble sleeping. Uh, hypersomnia. I guess that's what it is, I, some kind of trouble sleeping. Uh, but in any case, and it got expensive. Yeah, I have no idea how expensive it is either. That's, that's at least a barrier to it. All right. Yeah, I'm sure they're doing some drug testing. I talked to this uh, friend of mine who is a psychiatrist, and he said there might be difficult to test for. You know, some drugs you can't really test for. Anyways, I'm a total novice with that. Main point is you want to create an ethic of conscientiousness in your chess decisions, and maybe I'll show a couple things here. So Vishnu, this one's for you a little bit here, buddy. Let me show you what happened. So like I said, I did this uh, Carlsbad thing. Let's just get, let me just show the beginning here. And um, if you're going to, this to me is the not only the best way against the Queen's Gambit decline, but it's also just a simple system that I don't think you need too much, you know, it's not that hard to understand. Um, and... As I told Vishnu in that, I did a video, if you want to look, it's online. Uh, I think I called it like the Carlsbad for Vishnu or something like that. And the main point is you're playing for domination, first of all, with this knight here. And it's a very volatile situation. Basically, black has to find a way to relieve the pressure. And one thing I said in that video is... You shouldn't be obsessed with getting e4 in right away. In fact, the bummer for black is that you're holding the e4 threat over his head. Now, once e4 comes, if he doesn't respond to it, you're going to play e5 and f4. And of course, if he does respond to it and takes, you're going to open up the f file. So it's a very dangerous situation, and black has to like be every move, wonder about whether or not 
I'm going to get e4 in. Interesting. Ten bucks a ten bucks a pill. My uh, psychiatrist friend, you know, worked in the industry for a long time, and he took it because they were just sending him free samples. You know, that's the way it worked for those guys. So there's a variety of different moves here, and one thing about the system I like a lot is uh, I can't I can't memorize openings at this point in my life. It's really a bad situation. So the best I can do is kind of understand a structure. So g6 happens now. <clears throat> and um, like I said, there's a variety of different things that he could do. And the next move, I was able to play without thinking too long. Um, and it's the kind of move that unless you had seen some similar ideas, you wouldn't know about. And that's just to back it up with bishop h4. And the idea is... I really don't want to trade this guy off. He kind of really wants to park himself back here, if anything, to prevent trades and thereby, you know, really use your extra center pawn as your space advantage. Is g6 normal there? Um, well, we'll see. He wants to go to e6 and g7. Um, I definitely know it's a move, but like I said, Vishnu, I can't memorize all these different variations. No idea. <laughs> you know, no idea. Um, I haven't looked at this game with the computer yet. I definitely will when I go over it. This is just my initial response, you know, to this game. So um, the guy plays 96, and the thing about this move is he is thinking about maybe playing c5. So one of the cool things about this position for white is, you know, you kind of have a vocabulary of different plans. You know, we can play king here, for example. I could play the bishop back. I could play a rook to e1. Um, some people even think about things like b4. Honestly, I don't believe white should be playing for the minority attack, but it is. it should be at least maybe on your radar. So since c5 I want to take out, I play rook ad1. I thought that was a good move. Because the rook will be useful not only in stopping c5, but in any kind of e4 break that I make. So the guy plays king h1, or excuse me, a a6, and it's kind of weird. Like the problem now with c5 was... This is, I, I just figured I'm going to win the d pawn at this point if you play c5 immediately. So a6 is a weird move because, okay, you're stopping bishop b5, but it is a full tempo that you just gave me. Plus, I'm not sure about whether you've maybe weakened yourself on the queen side a little bit. Well, I said king h1. And another thing I knew just from kind of looking at similar positions was that the problem for black is that if he opens the position now, white's pieces are just much better. They're more active. You know, and he's just worse developed. And he's got this queen sitting on this file. So, for example, I think c5, my intention was to say here, here, knight f4, and that it's going to be very difficult to defend this guy. I think, for example, obviously bishop e6, there might be more than one problem. But I think I have moves just like bishop c4. And I think the pawn is gone. So um, I would have, you know, I would have checked that, but that was my thought that he couldn't actually play c5 anyway after the rook is on d1. So king h1 has to be a good building move. One And, and a thing, too, that's interesting about it is that I saw already that my bishop might want to go to g1. So it's not just getting the king out of this diagonal, but it's also freeing up that square for uh, my bishop. By the way, let me just say a couple words about my opponent. This is definitely a case where I'm playing what I thought was a superior opponent, definitely someone who has way more natural talent than me. This guy, uh, Mikola Bortnik from the Ukraine, huge uh, rapid and blitz player, Kind of like Andrew Yang, you know, he's up there and he's got a huge puzzle rush score and all this other stuff, you know. So if you wanted, if you wanted to measure 
chess talent in terms of blitz and uh, puzzle rush, then for sure this guy's just much better than me. And I don't have a problem with saying that he's better than me. I, I, I know that might sound like I'm making a joke by saying puzzle rush and blitz, but those are definitely measures of how good of a player you are, at least your, let's say, natural skill. Now notice Vishnu, he's an animal. He's talking about plans with G4, H4, H5. <laughs> Vishnu, no, we're just we're just we're just trying to control him, man. We don't want we don't want to lose our minds yet. If we play G4, the idea would be to take away the square of F5, which honestly he's not really getting to anytime soon. Okay, he does play knight g7, and we continue the dance with bishop f2. And here, uh, already it's difficult for black, I feel, because I don't see how he's ever going to stop e4. I can do it whenever I want. And there's no easy way for him to uh, fix his position, you know? Especially, and when I say that, I guess one thing I should stress is it's really not clear where this guy, for example, is going to go. So even though the next couple moves by black will seem maybe superficial, it's hard to know what the guy should do at this point. Okay. Tang the penguin I am guy. Yeah, that's not this guy, by the way, but I'm just comparing him to Tang because Tang is also a, you know about a 2,500 level GM over the board, but then when you look at his rapid and stuff, he's especially one minute, he's like you know, one of the best in the world. Okay, so um, did, I, did I say Andrew Yang? That would be really funny. Okay, uh, <laughs> Andrew Tang. <laughs> he must get that all the time. I hadn't even thought about that. So do I have to break with E4? I don't, and maybe I'm pulling the gun a little bit early, but it did feel correct to me, and I didn't really know how to improve my position more at this point. Like, maybe I could be hyper about it and play bishop g1. Uh, I'm sure bishop, actually, I'm sure g4, uh, Vishnu's move, is also fine. But I just wanted to see what he wanted to do here. I saw that coming, and I said, no, that's, it just, you know, I didn't think, I didn't think it would work. But he plays bishop g5. And now I haven't spent that much time in this position, but here I do start to tank. Um, I spend, what do I say, 14 minutes on this move. And I've been doing a lot of endgame puzzles, studies, and I feel like th this is the situation, honestly, where I'm weaker than most GMs. Like this is a, now, okay, so like, let me put it this way. The positional phase of the game is now over. I've won that. I'm definitely better. But now we're headed to the tactical phase, and it's a real mess. Clearly, he's doing, trying to be an opportunist on my king side and create grief. And I have to find a way to continue to control the pieces. Um, one thing in terms of how I understand chess is that uh, Smyslov has this great quote where he says, you know, that all positional uh, advantages culminate, strategies, positional strategies culminate in a tactical finish. And this is an example of it where it's going to get all of a sudden really messy. So I feel like, and this is something I'm going to analyze deeper with my, you know, just by myself and my notebook and all that. But I feel like white's two choices here were bishop c4, which is what I played, and rook f3. Just to play rook f3 and rook f1 and claim that I'm significantly better. Uh, the, so rook f3, rook f1, you know, you don't need to calculate it that much. But the problem is like, well, what's, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's next. Because the guy will put his bishop on e6. And so I'm not, it's not like I'm going to crack the f7 point in any meaningful way. Plus, do I really want to bring this other rook over to, to, to f1? It seemed like to me that he was already useful where he was. So I decided to pull the trigger here. Um, yeah, e5 and 94. He is going to do this stuff with bishop e3 to me, though. 
So I want to, um, and, and once bishop b3 comes, he wants queen h4. So I do have to be proactive. Okay, so I play bishop c4, bishop e6. I got, I'm going to call that forced. Now, the, the drawback here with my, the positional drawback with what I did is I'm helping him trade off stuff. And because he's cramped, uh, ideally, it's not the positional ideal thing. I'm, I'm obviously going for gold now when I do this. So I go takes, rook takes, and now queen b3. So we're looking at f7, we're looking at b7, and obviously we're trying to claim that these pieces are um, ineffective on the side of the board. Now, one funny thing here is I, I basically, it's not like necessarily like I missed his next move, but I did not think it was possible. Um, he played bishop e3, and um, it's kind of a puzzle rushy move, honestly. Like, there's all of a sudden a lot of tricks going on. The good news for me, though, is that at least I, be I believed in my position here because I'm better developed, my center control is great. The knight on h5, unless it mates me in some fantastic way, isn't a great piece. Now, one of the things, though, is I have to go for violence, and if I ever, for, if I ever play d5, then I'm going to lose this square, and, for example, then the knight becomes a genius with knight e5. Uh, good question. I did look at uh, d5 here, and what I couldn't figure out, this is a really good point, is if I just take it, and he goes bishop d7, what am I going to do about knight e5 coming? And if I feel like if he gets that piece onto e5, it's really going to be a strong defensive piece. So, for example, d6. And now I'd have to worry about both bishop e6 and knight e5. And I didn't see a way through there. But I definitely spent a lot of time uh, thinking about it. So I'm glad you brought that up. So I took the thing. Bishop e3, and I thought forever here, man. Um, yeah, I thought for, I think this was good. I thought for 23 minutes in this position. And this is why I led with the no blitz. And I did play uh, d5 now. I think it's a good move. We're going to look a little bit more about it. Um, now, before I go on with this game, I want to just share, when I did the lecture for Vishnu on the Carlsbad. I believe one of the games I covered was this Kasparov game, and I just want to go through it briefly because in the back of my mind, I had this same position. Now, this this is this, oh, I had the similar idea. This is the same position. Bishop e6 was what, this is Kasparov against Ulf Anderson, 1988. Rook a e1, and now takes. Knight f4, queen f2, really nice play, e4. So takes, takes, and obviously Kasparov had an idea after rook cd7, and he plays d5. So the thing about this is, in general, I, I think we can say we don't want to play d5 unless it is winning. We just don't want to do it. And in this case, it looks pretty good for uh, Kasparov. I'll just run through the moves here. Takes, bishop b5 is the trick. There's no rook d6 because of e5. So rook c7 takes, back, bishop e2, very nice. No trades, and now I'm threatening d6. Now, I want to say when I first analyzed this game, I was a little bit... I was a little bit disappointed because I was like, Gary, you had this beautiful center and now it's gone and I'm not sure exactly what's going on. But in fact, when you look closer at it, it's the A pawn will fall and when that A pawn falls, it's going to create all kinds of drama, not just the, the 
the loss of the pawn, but then weaken queenside squares. Snip. Thank you very much. And this is already, I guess, toast. The two outside uh, pass pawns. Actually, it's funny because we're going to get a very similar thing in uh, my game. So anyways, what I wanted to say was just I had that somehow in the back of my mind that when you play d5, you know, you want to have it really worked out, obviously, because you, you, you are giving loads of squares to black, especially things like e5, once you do play d5. All right, so go back. Uh, the guy, let's see here, bishop e3, and I did play d5 here. There was, let me just show one, uh, some interesting variations. Like, I didn't, one reason is I, I assumed I was threatening the pawn. It turns out I really wasn't. So, like, rook e7 takes, I assume this was his intention, uh, king g1, knight e3, and I might have compensation for the exchange, but, you know, I saw this in my mind's eye, and for a second I thought, oh, now I have knight d5, really tricky. But then notice that, no, it doesn't work because my knight is hanging at the end. So that was definitely a puzzle rush trick lying at the end of that for me. Okay, so here we go. d5. By the way, I'm not even sure this is, you know, we're going to see. I'll... I'll check it by myself and then with the computer later. Uh, but it, it feels like it should work. So this all felt forced to me. Now he took, and I took, obviously I'm threading the bishop. Bishop takes, knight f6. Now, okay, so I'm winning the queen for a piece, a rook, and a pawn, and this was a very hard decision for me to make. I, I saw it coming, but I wasn't totally convinced that I was winning. And in this position, I felt like I should be winning, that there should be some win. So when I saw this in my mind's eye, I was, I was hesitant to go in for it. Um, in the game, I feel like black folded too easily. Uh, let me just show a couple moves with what happened, and then I'll come back to this position. Um, he took, snip, snip, king g1, knight e4, and now, now I'm easily, I feel winning, because the queen's playing pinball over there, and, uh, you know, there's no, there's no counterplay. Uh yeah, and I can show you guys the rest of the game later, but that was, you know... Well, okay, let's run... I'll run through this. Uh, knight f5 here, hitting the rook. Rook b8. Now my knight gets active. Rook e4. There's no taking, I don't think, on b2. Oh, excuse me, it was... Uh, he played rook e5 or something. Oh dear, no, I got it all mixed up. Yeah, I, th I don't know. I'm like, rook b8, knight d5, rook e1, h3. There's no knight g3 stuff. Snip, snip. Now I get to, you know, everything is traded off. Totally winning. He tried to do h5, h4 to me, and yada, yada. But obviously, it's like the Kasparov game, but better. I'm going to have those pawns are just going to totally roll. Let me just share, uh, in the game, I was uncertain about, um, in this position, knight f6. Just on principle, first of all, I thought it was really important that he trade off um, one, tra trade off both of my rooks so that my rook can't complement the queen and the knight in forming a counterattack as happened in the game with the pawn on f7. So I thought it was going to go like this. Or this, this is what in, intuitively I thought would have been his best, best variation here. Rook takes, knight takes, king takes, knight takes. And uh, I cannot play queen b7 yet 
because of this. And yeah, this is, I, I definitely think this is at least clear advantage, but there were parts of me saying to myself, I'm not sure. I just wasn't totally certain that this was winning for me. So, um, yeah, this is why I feel like this is what he should have done. Anyway, so that was, I felt like, a reasonable game that I finally was able to play. It's been a while. And like I stated on the show before, the biggest problem I've had in recent tournaments was just in the early rounds I got to play these 2200s, and I wasn't knocking them down, and then I never even got to play anybody like this guy. And that was both discouraging and just terrifying because these 2200 kids can be really dangerous, and then, you know, that's how your rating is going to crash. I <laughs> play those kids all the time where you have to, like I said on before, if they're 400 points below you, you've got to beat them 9 out of 10 times just to hold your rating. So not so easy. Vishnu writes, uh, you played A4 in the end game and I was watching and wondered why you didn't play Rook D3 to go to C3 and then C7. In my first game, yeah, my first game, I felt like I was winning um, without much trouble, and I can't really, I, honestly, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, let me show another endgame position that I thought was really interesting. So, let me flip the board here. Uh, one opponent I've faced a lot is this guy, Inkbot Tengshur, and he's actually an older guy like me. Uh, used to be around 2,400 and now is around 2,300. Like me, I think, you know, life is dealing him all, you know, it's just hard to, you know, study and yada yada. But a guy with, I think, pretty good positional understanding, and especially as white, what I notice is that he um, really always tries to hold the position together. He never, it, very, very, seldom takes risks and wants to just hold the position. And so in that way, especially when I'm black, it's really hard to uh, beat the guy. So um, I thought I'd show you. So before I go into it, what I've been doing a lot of is these endgame studies and endgames. And one thing I want to say about them is that in contrast to like the Dvoretsky manual where you are learning algorithms, um, the end games that I get that are more, the, the practical advantages of them, I, I rarely get the algorithm stuff. I feel like I can do the algorithm stuff fairly reasonably, but I rarely get it. And it's more like just being able to play and analyze these really difficult situations. So we have bishop f4, king g7, e3, Rook over, and now I'm threatening Rook H2. So now he has to give me his good bishop. And I felt like I was, let's call it better here. Maybe not amazingly better, but better. Queen G4, B6. So now I'm threatening Bishop takes B2. He plays B3. Maybe he should have considered Rook B1. Snip, snip. A6, rook c4, b5, a, b, a, b, rook c2, rook a, a. Let's play two more moves and then we'll talk about what's going on. Rook b1, rook h8, bishop f1, rook h, b8. So, um, where do I get the practical endgame studies from? I have this book that I'm not going to recommend because it's just too hard to find and it costs like a gazillion dollars. You know, uh, it's this Russian book that I got when uh, I was in Moscow. Like the only time I was in Moscow, like 2005 or something like that. So I don't recommend even trying to find the thing online. Uh, I don't read Russian or anything. By the way, there's a guy in Siberia who is a chess, is like a software developer for Chessable. And he noted that my, uh, you know, I was trying to read some stuff off of it last time or something. And I pronounced the, the word for rook wrong because I was looking at the, the, uh, 
the the, the consonant wrong. It was and so it's I was think I was saying uh, padia for rook, and it's in fact ladia because the p and the l look kind of similar. Anyways, so uh, there are many different books though that you can get with end games in them. This one I like mostly because it. Um, combines studies with actual game uh, positions. Right, Ladia, that's right. And um, also I want to say, though, it is very difficult. So I, I do have students that I make them do sections of it, and uh, oftentimes they're just like, dude, this is too hard. I can't, I can't do it. So in some ways you might want to do other endgame books first. In any case, here we go. Uh, there's we get in a real okay let me say a little bit about this position i think my opponent felt that he was going to hold this and it probably is holdable but the bishops of opposite color are going to make it really violent because if i can get an initiative on the dark squares then he doesn't have he's down a piece on the dark squares and it's going to be really hard for him to get an initiative because this pawn is really blocking his own bishop in fact, if white could somehow amazingly throw that pawn away, then I think he would be completely fine. You know, imagine him throwing that pawn away and putting the bishop on d5. Then I'm going to have absolutely no chance of winning. So um, we're getting in a little time pressure. And by the way, one of the things I want to say about endgames that I, I find really interesting is, you know, you're in third hour of play, you're a little tired, it's going to feel like you've been punched in the mouth already. You know, your juices are kind of running and mistakes are going to be made in a totally different way than they are in the early phase of the game. Um, so, King F8. Now, I think a more practical move might have just been to put the rook on A3 first. But in a way, this is psychological because it's basically telling White that if you do nothing, my king is somehow going to find a way over here and then the game really will be over. So <laughs> we're going to see, though, there's some fateful, uh, fateful problems with the king going to f8. So my opponent plays f4. Now here's the most important thing to see about f4. It's not immediately obvious. And that is that it weakens e3. I play bishop f6, king f3, rook a3, rook h2. So note where I'm move 36 here. And yeah, it's getting spicy. He's got maybe five minutes left, and I've got maybe f about five minutes left too. So <laughs> this next move that I pull out of my hat, I... I couldn't totally calculate um, to the end, and I definitely missed at least one thing. And uh, I did see, though, I did see exactly the variation that happened in the game. Now, one thing, just as a word of practical advice for these situations is, pawns don't mean anything. Well, they mean something, but they mean far less than they usually do in these positions. Because if I can, like I said, if I can get an initiative, then that's what we want. Now, clearly what white has done, right, is said, well, you can't ever move this rook, so it's poor. So, you know, I'll just keep looking at it. Now, I, so I went for it with c4, takes, and now I actually have a big decision um, Probably practically better is b4, almost for certain. Um, we're, but that was only something you'd understand with analysis. Why I didn't do b4, though, was that after rook d2, now I can't play bishop d4, which is the move I played in the game. Uh, and if I play b3, then there's something like rook d3. However... One thing that's clear here is I don't I don't think I need to be a genius here. And if I just play king e7, you know, I've got a great position. And it's really kind of hard for him to do anything about it. So, um, yeah, let's call that an advantage to black. I, again, I'll look at this position more when I do the full analysis. 
anyways, uh, bishop d4. One reason I want to show you this is that really, like, there's some endgame study-like stuff that's going to happen here. So takes, rook takes, king g2. I played rook a8. He went for it with b6. And obviously, I needed to... I needed to see this move in advance. Rook a3. So now we've actually reached time control. And uh, the guy has some time to think here. But here, yeah, here things go a little bit wrong for him. Now, clearly, if he plays b7, it's this is going to be mate. So first he plays king h1. Snip. And here was the move that I saw for him that is, if I'd had more time, maybe, uh, at the beginning, I would have seen. Now, I'll just put his move on the board, and we'll come back to it. Um, well, let me show you the problem, actually, with bishop c4. Uh, if you want, you can think about what black should do here for a second. I'll babble for a minute. But he missed this tactic, and this is the tactic I saw when I played uh, 37 bishop d4. Um, and that is, bishop takes b6, thank you very much. I just take the thing, and rook takes is met by rook a1. So, after which, we're going to talk, we'll talk about that too, um, but the key trick that I realized he could play is rook h8 exclam. And we get this weird, like, position you'd think that looks like it came from a study where Bishop takes. Now notice, so there's no more mate over here, right? Because he's got this square. So I gotta take b7. Now I figure this is forced. One of these rooks over here. Queen. I gotta take the thing. He takes, and then my king has to go to this terrible square. And now, if anything, maybe white's well, it's a draw now, but it, if anything, you know, white has no problems at all because the pieces have become absolutely miserable, right? Maybe he should play, I don't know, maybe king g2 first. In any case, I can't, my king, I'm never going to win this position because my king is so terrible. Yeah. So, uh, snip, and you know, it's an interesting thing where white, I think, still believed he could draw this thing, and he still has practical chances, but the problem is that the uh, d5 pawn is so in the way of his bishop. And so maybe I'll just show the rest of this game, and then we'll call it a day. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah, we went into double score sheet territory here, right? So the guy played uh, rook g2, bishop d4. Snip, snip. And I played bishop d4 because I knew I would want to control f6. f5, g5. I'm pretty sure this is lost. Because the pawns are on light squares, and they're, they're just making that bishop on uh, c4 just superfluous. So yeah, I'll definitely do a deep dive on this position as well, but I, I just can't see it for um, white here. The pawns are really poisoning his bishop. And by the way, I want to say, there's. I feel like I've seen endgames like this out of a Benko, you know, out of a Benko gone wrong for white, and probably because I had white or something in a similar position. So rook d1, bishop e5, what do we do here? Rook g1, I might be able to take the thing now, but there's no, there's no rush. Because now I just want to fix the king. Rook h1, g4. Oh yeah, this is pretty pretty simple here. Rook h4, check. Now my king gets to improve. I should just take the pawn. I did this, and then I took the pawn. Rook c1, now I can trade it off. You know, why resign? Because... This is a well-known opposite color bishop thing where my pawn will advance to f3, and if these pawns weren't here, 
that's a known drawn position. But of course, you're going to have to give me the bishop, and then everything's going to fall apart. Uh, I had another end game in round two, and as Vishnu noted in round one, I had an end game as well. So you know, it was a victory for the end games. <laughs> and I'll say um, the last round, I played this kid, Praveen Balakrishnan, and uh, played a really nice game and prepped my French really well, even though my position was fundamentally sound. He played some stuff, maybe I'll show it next time, where I, I feel like he just knocked me out and I didn't have any uh, I didn't have any real chances that I felt. So I didn't feel like I played that poorly. Um, but definitely you could I could argue that my opening wasn't that good. And that's by all means uh, I think at least compared to other people, uh, my my weakest point. And one cool thing I realized about what my training is doing is trying to tailor my opening repertoire so that I get positions that I like. You know, I want closed maneuvering positions where I can think about what's going on in an intuitive way because I'm not that good tactically. And I want positions where we get an end game. And I don't want like this hectic thing that he threw at me. <laughs> and sometimes when you're black, especially when you're black and you face E4 and somebody throws the hammer at you, uh, that, I mean, anybody can get taken out like that. All right. Um, so, Kygrex, are you, you, you are the famous William Hogard, right? Yeah, that's totally, I guess, right? Um, so that's really cool. One thing, you know, so cool about this stream is I'm interacting with people all over the world. And I used to be able, I feel like I used to play when I was playing in Europe, I would meet more people. And, you know, anyways, I don't get to play that much. And now when I play these open tournaments in the US, honestly, I don't have any time to meet anybody. It's just like two rounds a day. And then I don't, yeah, I don't have any time to talk to anybody. And then I feel like the few hours I have in between the rounds, I'm just totally knocked out. Uh, but actually, on that note, let me just put out my, uh... oh, two things before we go. Um, first of all, we got the tournaments. So week and after next, maybe I'll see Vishnu over there. Vishnu, by the way, gave me that book over the test of time by Kasparov. After my 60 memorable games, the most expensive book ever. So that's my retirement policy over there. If it goes wrong for me, I'll sell that on eBay. And um, to kind of finish with the theme, I really felt like me doing that uh, little video for Vishnu helped me with the game I showed and just understanding the ideas. So I'll put my little shingle out if you want to do lessons with me. I offer lessons. And also, because I charge an extraordinary amount, if you just want to submit a game and have me look at it, we have a show here on chess.com, end of the month. And this month, I want to make sure people know it's going to be on Tuesday. So Tuesday the 25th. So what is that? 4 to 7 East Coast, 1 to 4. Excuse me. Yeah. 4 to 7 East Coast, 1 to 4 West Coast time. And you can, if you search like uh, the forums on chess.com and just search my name, uh, you'll see that. So two ways to have me look at your game if you like. All right, guys, I will be back next week. And uh, yeah, that'll be the week before the show. I'll give you an update how I'm doing. Thank you for following the stream. It really helps me kind of get in the mindset for what I need to do. And it puts me in a place where I'm not just totally alone in my own little chess study. Helping me, you know, if you're alone in your chess study, you're reading the Russian book, you're going to think it's Padia. And you're going to say Padia for like ever when in fact it's Ladia for the Rook. All right, everybody, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.